Income Tax 2023-2024. Child and Dependent Care Expenses Credit. Can you claim the credit? Part number one. Get ready and some coffee because we need extreme concentration when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts, a must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six-pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six-pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six-pack-like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. The information can be found in publication 503 Child and Dependent Care Expenses Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the second part of the income tax formula where the credits live, noting that the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Taxable income therefore basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula. But... It's only half the battle, half the equation. We then have the second half where we're going to take that taxable income, calculate the tax on it, which is a little bit more complicated than you would think because we don't have a flat tax. We've got the progressive tax system. Not only that, but some income subject not to ordinary income, but to other basically progressive tax structures like the qualified dividends, possibly long-term capital gains. That gets us to the tax before credits and other taxes. Then we have the credits and other taxes. Noting we're focused on the credits here. We have the credits up top and then these credits down below along with the payments. Either one, when we think about credits, is usually more beneficial to us than deductions, although both deductions and credits are good because a dollar deduction would simply decrease the taxable income and we'd get a benefit based on the tax rate and our income tax rate. But if we look at the credits, then typically we're going to get that full dollar of a benefit. However, if the deduction is up top in what we would call the non-refundable section, it could be limited by the amount of liability we have to consume it. Whereas if it's down here in what we call the refundable portion of a credit, then it might take the liability below zero, resulting in the tax code, the tax system being used not as a tax system, but as a welfare benefit safety net type of program. So in our formula, we have the taxes and credits. If it was a credit, it would be decreasing the liability by a dollar. Other taxes, if it was a dollar, it would be increasing by a dollar for the tax liability. An example being self-employment tax gets us to the total tax. And then we have the payments or withholdings that we make during the year and the refundable credits to finally get to the tax refund or the tax due. This is the form 2441, the child and dependent care expenses. Remembering that when we think about the impact on the tax return of dependents, children often have a large impact. The possible impacts, including the child tax credit, which we talked about in a prior presentation or section, and then possibly it could impact the earned income tax credit. We could also have an impact 
on our filing status, possibly going from single to head of household. And now we're looking at the child and dependent care expenses. So that would then feed into, here's the next schedule. I'm drawing the line between the two of them. This is the schedule three, additional credit and payments. Part number one, non-refundable credits. We're looking at line two, credits for child and dependent care expenses from form 2441 line 11. That then feeding into the form 1040. I'm drawing the line between the two forms here. The form 1040, page number two, where we have the tax and payment calculations, the bottom part of the formula in essence. And that would roll into line 20, amount from schedule three, basically being in this non-refundable credits area. All right. So can you claim the credit? So to be able to claim the credit for child and dependent care expenses, you must file form 1040, 1040, SR, 1040, NR, and meet all tests and tests you must meet to claim a credit for child and dependent care uh, expenses next. Let's take a look at those tests now. Uh, tests you must meet to claim a credit for child and dependent care expenses. Again, not to be confused with the child tax credit those two things are basically different. We're looking at the child and dependent care expenses here. So to be able to claim the credit for child and dependent care expenses, you must meet all the following tests. So you have a qualifying person test. The care must be for one or more qualifying persons who are identified on form 2441. See who is a qualifying person later. We'll talk about that in basically more detail. You would think they would be a qualifying child in essence, although the, the restrictions are a little bit more detailed here with age restrictions and whatnot than the dependent test. And then from the child tax credit. So remember, these are all kind of related because they're basically being based on a dependent, but there's different restrictions. And some of those restrictions, including the age uh, restrictions that we have to kind of keep straight in our mind in terms of what types of benefits might be tied to what types of dependents. So earned income test. So we're not talking about the earned income credit here. Although remember, the earned income credit could also be based on the number of children, for example, and the earned income. So we have an earned income test here. You uh, and your spouse, if filing joint, must have earned income during the year. However, see rule for student spouse or spouse not able to care for self under must have earned income later. Now, why would that be the case for this credit? And this helps to basically solidify in your mind what is actually happening rather than just trying to learn the rules in no context. You want to have a story because that helps you to recall the information. And why would the tax code be doing this? Well, the argument is that they're trying to free people up to earn revenue. So, so how can they prove that that is actually happening? Well, then you have to have actually earned income. And the argument is you were able to free yourself up to earn the income by having the child care, which is the justification for getting a credit for the child and dependent care expenses. So work-related expense test. You must pay child and dependent care expenses so you or your spouse of filing jointly can work or look for work. See, are these work-related expenses later? So again, the argument being you're trying to get child care so you can basically work. And so notice that could have different implications if you have a single uh, parent family, a single mom, a single dad versus a married situation. Because if you have a married situation and you have a one person working, you would expect the other person could then take care of the children just from a logistics standpoint. Whereas if you have a single family type of situation, single mom, single dad, then you would think uh, that that's going to be, you have a different dynamic, of course, if the person's working, you have no one to take care of the kid. So you must make payments for child and dependent care to someone you and your spouse can't claim as a dependent. So obviously, if you're going to say, hey, we're going to give you a depend a credit based on child care, you might say, well, the, I'm already paying one of my kids, my older kid, an allowance why don't I just get to write that off? Because part of their chores are to take care of the care, take care of the kid. But obviously, the IRS that's not really what it's designed to do. To basically, uh, it's designed usually kind of outside of the family. You would think. So now you've got some rules with relation to: Are they going to be related to? Who are you actually paying the dependent care? 
So if you make payments to your child, including stepchild or foster child, he or she can't be your dependent and must be age 19 or older by the end of the year. So you can't make payments to uh, your spouse and uh, the parent of your qualifying person if your qualifying person is your child and under age 13. So why would this be just the general idea? Obviously, if you're married, you can't deduct a payment that's made to your spouse because in theory, you're basically like one entity for taxes that would be like paying yourself. So obviously that kind of makes sense. If they're already your child, you can't pay your oldest child to take care of your younger child because in theory, you're already getting a benefit from the older child if they're claimed as a dependent on your tax return. So you might be getting you know, all these benefits related to them, at least as a dependent, at least the, the, the dependent uh, child or dependent credit, if not the child tax credit uh, and so on. But if they are not being claimed as a dependent on your tax return, then they, you would think that they might qualify because now you're paying for someone to take care of your kids that is independent and you're not getting other benefits on uh, your taxes. So the parent of your qualifying person, uh, if your qualifying person is is uh, your child and under age 13. So you could come up with complex type of situations where of course you don't have a married type of couple situation and you have the two, two different parents are taking care of the child. You would think that one parent shouldn't be getting a deduction in essence for paying the other parent that's taking care of their own uh, child, right? So that would be, you know, because obviously it's their own, you know, child that they're taking care of rather than taking care of the child so that the other person could work, which is the design of the credit, you would think. All right. So joint return test. So your filing status must be single, head of household, or qualifying surviving spouse. What are they leaving out here? They're leaving out the j married filing separate. Remember that if you're single, then you could, if, if you're not married, the worst filing status is single, and then you could step up to head of household, typically requiring a, a dependent. If you are married, you will typically file married filing joint, but have the option to possibly file married filing separate. However, the IRS is quite skeptical of people doing that because you might take advantage of credits like these. Therefore, they limit the credits in those cases. So if you are married, uh, you must file a joint return unless an exception applies to you. See what's your filing status later. So provider identification test. You must identify the care provider on your tax return. See care provider identification test later. So we talked before that you might have care that someone is like your household employee, in which case you have that whole possibly payroll kind of thing and that you have to basically be dealing with possibly. Or oftentimes people are paying someone outside to take care of their child. So they're taking the child to someone else, in which case the IRS wants you to basically rat them out. You are getting a tax benefit, not a deduction, but in this case, a credit. They want you to tell them who you paid so that they can not only verify the credit that you took, but also possibly verify the person that you paid is reporting income on their side in a similar situation as an employee employer situation where the employer is forced to do the W-2 and so on to report the employee that received the money so the IRS can go after the employee to make sure that they paid their taxes. So if you exclude or deduct dependent care benefits provided by a dependent care benefit plan, the total amount you exclude or deduct must be less than the dollar a limit for qualified expenses, generally $3,000 if you had one qualifying person or 6,000 if you had two or more qualifying persons in order for you to claim a credit on the remaining amount. So if you had two or more qualified persons, the amount you exclude or deduct will always be less than the dollar limit because the total amount you can uh, exclude or deduct is limited to $5,000. See reduced dollar limit under how to figure the credit later. Who is a qualifying person then? 
Your child and dependent care expenses must be for a care of one or more qualifying persons. A qualifying person is your qualifying child who is your dependent and who was under age 13 when care was provided, but see child of, di of divorced or separated parents or parents living apart later. So that's going to be the most common type of situation that you would think. So if you have a child, then there's these different age limits. Do, the first question is, do they qualify as a dependent? If they qualify as a dependent, you can go through the flow chart for the dependency test, which has age limits that are going to be related to it. First, you want to see if they're a qualifying child typically, and then do they qualify for the child tax credit, which has a different age limit than qualifying here for the dependent care expenses this being a lower age limit the idea being that if they're much over 13 i believe then possibly they can you know take care of themselves at least to some uh degree a little bit more independently would be the general idea i would guess for the lower uh age limit for the qualified dependent care versus you know child tax credit and qualifying as a dependent so your spouse who wasn't physically or mentally able to care for themselves and lived with you for more than half the year so obviously normally hopefully the spouse wouldn't be qualifying but if this if you have a disabled type of situation you're in the similar kind of boat where you're going to possibly need to pay for help to care for a spouse that can't care for themselves in order to earn income so a person who wasn't physically or mentally able to care for themselves lived with you for more than half the year and either, so now it's someone else, but uh, they're not able to care for themselves and was your dependent. You would think that would be the other common scenario. They're your dependent. They don't qualify at, you know, under uh, 13 or whatnot, but they do qualify as a dependent, but they're not able to care for themselves. So uh, would have been your dependent except that. So now we're thinking... Uh, really kind of outside the norm they they're not actually your dependent but the only reason they're not your dependent is he or she received gross income of 4700 meaning they didn't meet the income test because that's a fairly low test otherwise they would have been your dependent and therefore you still might be able to qualify for the credit even though they might not qualify as your dependent he or she filed a joint return so you or your spouse, if filing jointly, could be claimed as a dependent on someone else's 2023 return. All right, dependent defined. A dependent is a person other than you or your spouse for whom you could be claimed as an uh, ex-exemption. So to be uh, your dependent, a person must be your qualifying child or your qualifying relative. So they're, they're talking in terms of an ex exemption and they're basically using similar terminology that we saw before the changes to the tax code were, were one of the things that you got as a benefit of having a dependent was the exemption and then they changed the tax code so that they simplified and removed in essence, you know, an uh, exemption and then they put in place with that increase in the standard deduction and then of course you've got the credits. So, however, the deductions for personal and dependency exemptions for tax year 2018 through 2025 are suspended, and therefore the amount of the deduction is zero. But in determining whether you may claim a person as a qualifying relative for 2023, the person's gross income must be less than 4700 All right, qualifying child. To be your qualifying child, a child must live with you for more than half the year and meet uh, other requirements. So more information. So for more information about who is a who is a dependent or a qualifying child, you can see publication 501. So we talked about in prior presentations the general rules for qualifying uh, as a dependent and then whether or not they're a qualifying child with regards to the child tax credit and then talking here qualifying for the age test for our credit here so physically or mentally not able to care for oneself a person who can't dress so what does that mean so we saw some basically exceptions to the general age rule and child rule and it was based on people that can't care for themselves so now we of course have to define what that means so that people don't try to take advantage of a situation and say well yeah they can't care for themselves because he 
guy won't eat din- guy doesn't know how to cook dinner doesn't know how to cook anything but spaghetti that's not that doesn't that's not that's not a formal definite anyway person who can't dress clean or feed themselves because of physical or mental disabilities are considered not able to care for themselves also persons who must have constant attention to prevent them from injuring themselves or others are considered not able to care for themselves person qualifying for part of a year so you determine a person's qualifying status each day for example if your child for whom you pay child and dependent care expenses turns 13 years old and no longer qualifies on september 16th count only those expenses through september 15th also see yearly limit under dollar limit later so we have the age test of 13. we can imagine a situation where the child turns 13 during the tax year what happens do we lose the credit entirely do we get the credit for the whole year or what we have to do is calculate the credit up until the child turned 13 because of course we're paying those expenses you would think uh, throughout the year so we should be able to calculate the expenses that we're paying up and through that point in time and we might also be limited by the dollar limit so birth or death of otherwise qualifying person so in determining whether a person is a qualifying person a person who was born or died in 2023 is treated as having lived with you for more than half of 2023 if your home was the person's home more than half the time he or she was alive in 2023 so we have these tests similar to what we saw on the dependence tests that someone has to be living with you but obviously if they died during the year that's going to impact the amount of time they were living with you compared to the entire year so you would think it would make sense we do the calculation as to whether they meet that test based on the time they were with us during the partial part of the year taxpayer identification number you must include on your return the name and taxpayer identification number generally the ssn social security number of the qualifying person persons if the correct information isn't shown the credit may be reduced or disallowed so obviously we need to report the social security number so they know who the person is making sure that people aren't taking advantage of uh, the credits individual taxpayer identification number that's the i-10 for aliens so if you don't have a social security number you might you have this i-10 situation to identify people if your qualifying person is a non-resident or resident alien who doesn't have and can't get an ssn social security number use that person's i-10 the i-10 is entered wherever a social security number is required on a tax return if the alien doesn't have an i-10 he or she must apply for one so see form w7 application for irs individual taxpayer identification number for details the i-10 is for tax use only it doesn't entitle holder to social security benefits or change the holder's employment or immigration uh, status under the u.s law so this becomes kind of an issue because the the when we pay people and so on you you could have situations where they're subject to social security withholdings if there were like an employee situation uh and if they're not going to get a benefit from the social security it would make sense that they wouldn't be paying into the social security and that kind of muddies up uh the the situation sometimes but we might talk about that later adoption taxpayer identification that number that's the a10 so if your qualifying person is a child who was placed in your home for adoption and for who for whom you don't have a social security number you must get an a10 for the child so you can file form w7a application for taxpayer identification number for pending u.s adoptions child of divorced or separated parents or parents living apart so even if you can't claim your child as a dependent he or she is treated as your qualifying person if so now we have more complex situations where we have a divorce or separated parents and then we we know that we have these custody issues with regards to them and you can end up with these strange situations where they might not be qualifying as a dependent but still possibly allowing you to claim the credit again usually an unusual situation but something to be aware of 
the child was under age 13 or wasn't physically or mentally able to care for themselves. The child received over half of his or her support during the calendar year from one or both parents who are divorced or legally separated under a decree of divorce or separate maintenance, are separated under a written separation agreement, or live apart at all times during the last six months of the calendar year. The child was in the custody of one or both parents for whom uh, for more than half the year and you were the child's custodial parent. That usually means basically they're living with you for more of the year. So the custodial parent is the parent with whom the child lived for the greater number of nights uh, in 2023. This is, of course, stuff that you would like to get worked out between the, 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 two, the two parents to make sure that it's lined up in the agreement you know, what are going to be the tax consequences and so forth. So there aren't fights basically about who's the custodial parent and arguments on who's has more days. So you can count the nights so you could prove that you're the custodial parent and so on and so forth. But those things happen some, sometimes so you have to understand what that means. So if the child uh, was with each parent for an equal number of nights, the custodial parent, so that often is the case, right? Because they split it up evenly. So the custodial parent is the parent with the higher adjusted gross income. Some people think that that's not fair because why would it be based on income? But you would think that kind of makes sense as the tiebreaker because if the child is spending an even amount of time in both places, the person who has higher income is probably the one that's you know, influencing them more on a, on a financial side. So for details and uh, an ex exception for parents who work at night, you can see publication 501, the non-custodial parent can't treat the child as a qualifying person, even if that parent is entitled to claim the child as a dependent under the special rules for a child of divorced or separate parents. All right, so, so you must have earned income. So here we go with the whole earned income thing, remembering this credit is designed to help people to work. That's the idea of it. So they want to have proof of earned income in order to justify the payment of someone to take care of the kid, which was done in order to generate revenue is the general idea. So to claim the credit, you and your spouse of filing jointly must have earned income during the year. Earned income, what does that mean then? Earned income includes wages, of course, salaries, tips, other taxable employee compensation, and net earnings from self-employment, like a Schedule C typically. So a net loss from self-employment reduces earned income. So earned income also includes strike benefits and any disability pay you report as wages. Generally, only taxable compensation is included. For example, foreign earned income you exclude from income isn't included. So in other words, if you have foreign earned income, the question is who is paying, who has to claim the taxes between the two countries? If you're not paying U.S. taxes on it, then you don't really have any earned income for U.S. tax situations. And therefore, you wouldn't think you'd get a credit related to it if there's a requirement of earned income in order to get the credit. So however, you can elect to include non-taxable combat pay in earned income. So here's that combat pay popping up again. So if someone's in the military, they're in combat. They're laying down their life for the for the cause for the country. Then you know they might get some tax benefits on it, <laughs> including if they if the, the idea would be that the combat pay would not be included uh, in income, which is usually beneficial. But you can imagine sometimes if you need the income in order to claim a credit, it would actually be beneficial to to include the combat pay in income, so that you have a higher income to get the credit. We saw a similar situation with the earned income tax credit, for example. So if you are filing a joint return and both you and your spouse received non-taxable combat pay, you can each make your own election. In other words, if one of you makes the election, the other one can also make it, but doesn't have to. So a lot of flexibility with the combat pay. Including this income will give you a larger credit only if your uh, or your spouse's other earned income is less than the amount entered on line three of form 2441. So usually, you know, less income is better, right? But when you get into these lower income situations where you need more income 
in order to generate the credit, that's when it becomes kind of a messy situation, which is kind of funny because the lower income tax returns, the ones that you would think would be the easiest to do, become the most complex in certain situations. Tip. So you can elect to include your non-taxable combat pay and earned income when figuring your credit for child and dependent care expenses, even if you elect not to include it and in earned income for the earned income uh, credit or the exclusion or deduction for dependent care benefits. So in other words, we saw this same situation when you calculate the earned income credit where you might want to include it in income to calculate that credit. Well, you might ask, well, if I include it in income to calculate that credit, do I have to include it in income to calculate this credit? And again, the, the idea would be possibly not, right? You might be able to include it for that credit and not this credit or for this credit and not that credit and so on. Uh, so members of certain religious faiths opposed to social security. So this section is for persons who are members of certain religious faiths that are opposed to the participation in social security act programs and have an IRS approved form that exempts certain income from social security and Medicare taxes. So those forms are form 4361. Man, I wish I could exempt myself from paying the <laughs> anyway, form 436. Application for exemption from, from self-employment tax for use by uh, ministers, members of religious orders, and Christian science practitioners. And so that's where, the, okay, form 4029, application for exemption from Social Security and Medicare taxes and waiver of benefits for use by members of uh, recognized religious groups. So that's somewhat of an unusual situation. Of course, each form is discussed here in terms of what it is or isn't earned income for purposes of the child and dependent care credit. For information on the use of the, uh, these forms, you can see publication 517, social security and other information for members of the clergy and religious workers. Form 4361, whether or not you have an approved Form 4361 um, uh, amounts you received for performing ministerial duties as an employee are earned income. Uh, this includes wages, salaries, tips, and other taxable employee compensation. However, amounts you receive for ministerial duties, but not as an employee, don't count as earned income. Examples include fees for performing marriages and honoraria for delivering speeches. So any amounts you receive for work that isn't related to your ministerial duties in earned income. Form 4029. Whether or not you have an approved form 4029, all wages, salaries, tips, and other taxable employee compensation are earned income. However, amounts you received as a self-employed individual don't count as earned income. So what isn't earned income then? So these are going to be the things that are, you know, we might have those things that are kind of in the middle. These are the ones they're saying aren't included. Earned income doesn't include amounts uh, excluded as foreign earned income, including any housing exclusion on form 2555. So whenever you see that foreign earned income, whenever you have 2555, that often complicates the return as tax preparers. The question being, do I want to be doing those types of returns or not doing those types of returns? What's my goal as a tax preparer in terms of the clients I'm picking up? Pension and annuities, social security and railroad retirement benefits. So obviously you're in the age of retirement, you're receiving those benefits, you're not earning that income. It's not like you had to basically have someone take care of your child so that you can receive social security benefits, right? They sent you the check no matter what you... So workers' compensation, so uh, interest and dividends. So again, this is income you have to report typically oftentimes, but it's not earned income. If you've got money in stocks and bonds, you're going to be generating revenue from them. And it's not going to be dependent upon whether you have someone taking care of your kids so you can help to get that revenue generated, right? Unemployment compensation. So obviously, if you're not employed and you're getting compensation for not being employed, you don't need to pay someone to, to take care of your kids theoretically because you're hanging out with them <laughs> uh, scholarship and fellowship grants except for those reported on form w-2 and paid to you for teaching or other services non-taxable uh, work fair payment 
child support payments received, income of a non-resident alien that isn't effectively connected with a U.S. trade or business, or any amount received for work while an inmate in a penal institution. So obviously, if you're in the penal institution, you're probably not taking care of the kid. It's not going to help you too much to be paying someone to take care of the kid so that you have free time to take care of them because you're in a penal institution in jail, basically. So can you claim the credit? So here's our flow chart. Start here. Was the care for one or more qualifying uh, person? If yes, we continue. If no, then we're going to say to the no row. So if yes, do you have earned income during the year? So we need to have some earned income. If yes, we continue. Did you pay the expenses to allow you to work or look for work? That's the reason that we're paying for the expenses so it can free us up to work. If yes, uh, were your payments made to someone you or your spouse could claim as a dependent? Uh, if we have the two uh, yes here, uh, were your payments made to your spouse or uh, to the parent of your qualifying person who is your qualifying child and under age 13. So we have no versus yes going in the two directions. Uh, you can find this flowchart, by the way, on the, the publication so you can see it all in basically one place. So were your payments made to your child who was under uh, the age of 19 at the end of the year? So now we're looking at that situation where basically if they're your child, uh, then you can't pay them if they're qualifying as a dependent typically. But if they're not qualifying as a dependent, you would think maybe you could still get the deduction or credit if you're paying the child who's filing their own taxes. We have the yes, I uh, can't claim and then no. So are you single? So uh, are, are you single? If no, are you filing a joint return? If yes, we're going to move down here. So let's go to the joint return. Do you meet the requirements uh, to be considered unmarried? If no, you can't. We're going to say yes, going down here. Do you know the care provider's name, address, and identification number? If no, did you make a reasonable effort to get it? Meaning you have to give us the identification number uh, of the person that you did the care for un unless basically you tried to do it and you couldn't do it. You did your due diligence. If yes, did you have more than one qualifying person? If no, are you excluded or deducting at least 3,000 of dependent care benefits? And then uh, no, you may, you may be able to claim the child and dependent care credit fill out the form. All right, so there's the general flow chart. So rule for student spouse or spouse not able to care for, for self. Your spouse is treated as having earned income for any month that he or she is a full-time student or physically or mentally not able to care for themselves. Your spouse must also live with you for more than half the year. So now we have this situation where we have the full-time uh, student type situation. So if you're married, now you have two people. If one person is working, then you would think the other person would be able to take care of the kids at, unless possibly they're doing something like we, they're trying to give benefits for someone that's uh, going to school, for example. So if you are filing a joint return, this rule also applies to you. You can be treated as having earned income for any month you are a full-time student or not able to care for yourself. So figure the earned income of the non-working spouse described under one or two above as shown under earned income limit under how to figure the credit later. Uh, this rule applies uh, to only one spouse for any one month. If in the same month, both you and your spouse don't work and are either full-time students or not physically or mentally able to care for yourselves, only one of you can be treated as having earned income on that month. So full-time student then, what does that mean? Now we've introduced a new definition. So, so this often comes down to the number of credits because obviously if you just take like one small class that's like one credit, then you would think that uh, you'd still might have time to take care of the kid, I would think would be the general rationale here. So what does it mean? So you are a full-time student if you are enrolled at a school for the number of hours or classes that the school considers full-time. So it's dependent in part on the school because of course different schools have different credit structures like semester credits versus 
quarter credits, for example. So you must have been a full-time student uh, for some part of each of five calendar months during the year. The months need to be consecutive. So school, the term school includes high school, colleges, universities, technical trade, and mechanical schools. A school doesn't include an on-the-job training course, correspondence school, or school offering courses only through the internet. Idea being, if it's through the internet, you think you're, you're at home at that point and possibly could take care of the... So are these work-related expenses? Child and dependent care expenses must be work-related to qualify for the credit. Expenses are considered work-related only if both the following are true. They allow you or your spouse, if filing jointly, to work or look for work. That's the point of the credits. They are for a qualifying person's care. So working or looking for work, what does that mean then? We have another definition we need to define here. So to be work-related, your expenses must be allowing you to work or look for work. If you are married, uh, you or your spouse must work or look for work. Note, however, that the employment-related expenses are limited to the lower of the earned income of you or your spouse. So if you or your spouse was a full-time student or disabled, see rule for student spouse or spouse not able to care for self earlier. So your work can be for, for others or in your own business or partnership. So it can be either full-time or part-time, and it can be either in or out of your home. So work also includes actively looking for work. However, if you don't find a job and have no earned income for the year, you can't take the credit. So we have this idea that you could be looking for work to be qualifying, but if you don't find any work and you have no earned income, then you're gonna run into the problem in terms of the earned income limitation on the credit. So, so C, you must uh, earn income earlier. So an expense isn't considered work related merely because you had it while you were working. The purpose of the expense must be to allow you to work. Whether your expenses allow you to work or look for work depends on the facts. Example, all right. So the cost of a babysitter while you and your spouse go out to eat isn't normally a work-related expense. So now you're paying someone, but you're not really paying them so that you can go work. You're paying them to do entertainment type of things. And you would think that's kind of a luxury, not something that they're trying to do to, to help people to earn the necessities, to earn income. Example two, you work during the day. Your spouse works at night and sleeps during the day. You pay for care of your five-year-old child during the hours when you are working and your spouse is sleeping for uh, your expenses are considered work-related. So this, in this case, you have someone possibly there, but they're sleeping, so they can't really take care of the kid while they're sleeping. And so you would think that that would be freeing up the time so that you can work and therefore possibly justifiable as uh, uh, a work-related item. Uh, so volunteer work. For this purpose, you aren't considered to be working if you do unpaid volunteer work or work for a nominal salary. So in other words, if you're, if you're doing work that you don't need to do in order to generate the revenue, it's not you know, required in, uh, in that case. And that's what the, the credit is there for, to free people up to earn the revenue in order to take care of themselves and the family. So work for part of the year. So if you work or actively look for work during only part of the period covered by the expenses, then, then you must figure your expenses for each day. So now it gets a little bit more complex in terms of figuring the expenses, not for the entire year, but for the partial of the year. For example, if you work all year and pay care expenses of $250 a month, 3000 for the year, all expenses are work related. Now remember, these are expenses you're paying for childcare. So you're paying them, you can follow them in QuickBooks or in your bank account, right? You could see the expenses happening on a monthly or weekly or bi-weekly basis. Uh, and then you can annualize them. Or if you don't qualify for the full year, you can calculate the amount of the year that you qualify for and when those payments went out, usually on like a monthly basis. However, if you work only uh, or look for work for only two months and 15 days during the year, you pay expenses of $250 a month. Your work-related expenses are limited to uh, 625, which is the, the 21 two uh, months times the 250. 
So temporary absence from work. So you don't have to figure your expenses for each day during a short year, temporary absence from work, such as for, for vacation or a minimal illness, if you have to pay the care anyways. So in other words, it, you know, with if it was a temp, you took a vacation or something like that, you still have to pay for the care expenses. Uh, and so, so you would think that that would still be a, a situation where you're paying for the full year. So instead, you can figure your credit, including the expenses you paid for the period of absence. An absence of two weeks or less is a short temporary absence. An absence of more than two weeks may be considered a short temporary absence depending on the circumstances. Example, you pay a dependent care center which uh, complies with all state and local regulations to care for your two-year-old daughter so you can work full time. The center requires payments for, da uh, for days when a child is absent. So you take eight days off from work as a vacation days because the absence is less than two consecutive calendar weeks. Your absence is a short temporary absence. You aren't required to allocate expenses between days worked and days not worked. And that's nice. So the entire fee for the period that includes the eight vacation days may be work related expenses. All right, example two, you pay a nanny to care for your two year old son and four year old daughter so you can work. You became ill and missed four months of work, but received sick pay. You continue to pay the nanny to care for the children while you are ill. Your absence isn't a short temporary absence and your expenses aren't considered work related. Part time work. So if you work part time, you must generally figure your expenses for each day. However, if you are required to pay for care weekly, monthly, or in another way that includes both days worked and days not worked, you can figure your credit during, uh, including the expenses you paid for days uh, you didn't work. So any day when you work at least one hour is a day of work. Let's take a look at an example here. So you work three days a week. Uh, while the work, uh, your six-year-old child atten attends a daycare center which complies with all state and local regulations. You can pay the center $150 for any three days of work or $250 for five days a week. So uh, your child attends the center five days a week. So you must, f five days a week, so you must allocate your expenses for dependent care between days worked and days not worked, your work-related expenses are limited to $150 a week. Example two, the facts are the same as in example one, except the center doesn't offer a three-day option. The entire 250 weekly fee may be a work-related expense in that case.